All right, so we're here from the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust, and I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. So uh, we would like to start by acknowledging that Indigenous peoples have had and continue to have presence and deep connection with the lands on and near the Oak Ridges Marine. These lands are the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the Chippewas of Georgina Island, Rama and Beausoleil, and of the Mississaugas of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, and Scugag Island, the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We'd like to thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. We acknowledge that this land and its peoples, because that's the first step to reconciliation, is recognizing Indigenous people and their inherent rights to the land, and that they have been subjected to colonial oppression and injustice, which continues to this day. We need to continue a lifelong journey of understanding how our collective past brought us to where we are today, and how to create a better future for our relationship with Indigenous peoples and the land. We give our gratitude to the Indigenous peoples on and near the Oak Ridges Moraine, who have had a deep kinship of reciprocity with this land since time immemorial. We recognize that working together will strengthen our responsibility to the land by including ecological traditional knowledge systems for an equitable and sustainable future. How do we help at the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust? About 90% of the marine is privately owned, so we work with landowners to protect ecosystems and habitat across the marine, and we use a variety of different tools to do this. So a land trust is a nonprofit uh, charitable organization which um, acquires land or interests in land, things like conservation easements, which we'll get into, uh, for the purposes of conservation. And uh, we can receive donations, both monetary or of land and easements, and we are mandated to protect them in perpetuity. So if you donate your farm to us, we won't put condos on it in 15 years when we change our mind. Um, so the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust contributes to the federal government's goal of protecting 30% of public lands by 2030. We connect people with nature, we support climate change resiliency, um, and we help protect ecologically significant lands on and near the marine forever. And we do a lot of public educational programming, which is what we're doing here tonight, but we also do stuff like present at farmers markets and municipal events. We go into elementary schools, we do guided walks and uh, things like that. So, there's a really wonderful thing run by the Canada Revenue Agency called the Ecological Gifts Program, which helps to protect land and you know, vital habitat for um, species at risk and all wildlife and plants. Um, but it does so in a way that it gives a tax break to landowners. Um, you can have something like a conservation easement where you get to live on your land and you can even farm part of it, but part of it is set aside and protected for, um, for wildlife and for uh, important habitat. And um, you can yeah, get some fi great financial incentives while doing that. Right now, we have a really cool uh, project that we're involved with at the Land Trust. We're restoring habitat for the Kirtland's Warbler in Northumberland County out by Grand Araska Forest. And this is a songbird which only breeds around the Great Lakes. Most of them breed in Michigan, but there's some in Wisconsin and Ontario. They spend their winters in Bermuda. And um, they're extremely picky about where they live. They have to nest in two types of pine trees, the jack pine or the red pine, which we've learned recently. And those trees need to be between about five and 15 years of age. And um, jack pine depends on fires in order for its cones to open and its seeds to germinate. So indigenous peoples historically uh, did controlled burns across uh, Turtle Island, and that helped a lot of these species thrive. Um, but with the arrival of European colonizers, those practices were suppressed and um, the species like Kirtland's warbler that depended on those habitats and maintenance of them uh, really suffered. And so we're restoring this lost habitat to the marine that won't just benefit the Kirtland's warbler, but lots of other species, eastern hognose snake, monarch butterfly, meadowlark, bobolink, short-eared owl, uh, lots of things uh, like that sort of pine oak ecosystem, which has become very rare. And uh, there's lots of other great programming coming up over the next little while. We have uh, something next week, which is the uh, Birds of the Arc Regional Forest webinar. And uh, the following Saturday, we're doing a guided walk, uh, which is going to be really excellent um, at one of the Arc Regional Forest tracks um, with my supervisor, Eileen, who's a super knowledgeable birder. Uh, lots of things are starting to show up right around now. Um, I was out a few days ago and I had rusty blackbirds and a yellow bellied sapsucker, and there's swamp sparrows back and barn swallows. Um, Fox sparrows, field sparrows, lots of things are starting to move through right now. Sandhill cranes, it's an exciting time of the year to be a bird lover. And then I'm leading a uh, Pride Month nature uh, walk at our Maple Cross Nature Reserve in June and uh, doing a queer ecology webinar in June as well to tie in with that. And if you're interested in learning more about any of those events, 
um, you can visit uh, the oakridgesmarine.org slash workshop and events, and I will throw that link in the chat. Now, I'd like to introduce our guest today. This is Matt, and uh, we're super happy to have Matt here. Matt is a super gifted naturalist, um, currently a high school teacher in Ajax who teaches biology and environmental sciences. He's done work with turtles at Algonquin, as well as Rondo, which is one of my favorite provincial parks. Um, worked on biosurveillance, um, the idea of using wasps to help uh, control the um, emerald ash borer, which is a really devastating invasive species. Um, run a lot of different nature-themed day camps for kids, and uh, worked in nature interpretation in Ontario parks. And yeah, we've had some we've had some really wonderful conversations talking about reptiles and amphibians and plants and things like that. And I'm I'm glad that I get to uh, glad that he gets to share his, his uh, knowledge with us tonight. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will uh, hand it over to Matt. Awesome, thanks. That was a nice introduction. Woo! I got to live up to the hype. Oh my goodness. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop over here and I'm gonna pop on the screen so we can get this uh, this show started here. Oops, and I don't know how to use a computer. There we go. Uh, can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So hi, oh, I'm guys. Wait, I'm... no, actually, sorry. Nope. nope. Yeah, I can share that. Give me three seconds. It's not working. Share screen. Sorry, guys. My apologies. I uh, I I'm having flashbacks from COVID when I had to teach online. Yeah, screen sharing. That's working, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. There you go. How's that? Great, great. Fantastic. All right, cool. We'll get going, guys, so we don't uh, don't waste anybody's time. So again, sorry, I'm Matt Ireland, and yeah, here it is, the wonderful things of spring. You'll have to bear with me. Uh, I teach high school kids all day, so I'm never sure which level uh, to put things at. You know, uh, so if I start speaking words that are too simple, tell me to make it a little more complex. Or if I make it too complex, tell me to dumb it down a bit and we'll uh, we'll get going. So this webinar um, series is just talking about all of the cool things in spring that you can see. Unfortunately, I can't talk about all of them all at once because we would take us you know, many days uh, because there's so many amazing things out there to see. Um, so I thought I'd focus on a couple of neat things that are in York region, Durham region, wherever you guys come from on the Oak Ridges Moraine, or if you're coming from much farther away, as long as you're within Ontario, you'll be able to see um, you know, 99% of this stuff out there. I'm going to focus on some plants and some, some bugs and some amphibians because those guys generally tend to get less love, at least the, uh, the plants, uh, the insects a little bit, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. Everyone loves birds. They're amazing. But I hopefully at the end of this, you'll be able to look a little closer at some of these, you know, quote unquote, weird things that are around us. So I'll start off with what everybody loves. Everybody loves uh, spring wildflowers or just wildflowers in general. Uh, and so if you look on the, oops, see if I get a look, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. That's okay. If you can't, I'll just point to the side there. If you look at the, um, the flowers on the other side of the screen, I just put a mishmash of different things that are flowering, you know, almost right now. It depends on the area you're in. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting with wildflowers. What you can do is if in your area, say the trilliums are flowering and, you know, you might miss them, you can travel a little farther north and you can chase spring north as spring comes later and later, the farther north you go. If you drive down to southwestern Ontario now, you're going to see flowers that are not even blooming here. Anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about wildflowers. And again, if anyone has any questions, just you know, write them in the chat and jump in, and I'd be glad to answer them. So our spring wildflowers, um, they have a life cycle where it's sort of like a, it's not a live fast, die young, but it's a grow as fast as you can before the trees above you leaf out and shade you so you don't get any more light to photosynthesize or to make energy. So a lot of our spring wildflowers, they disappear. And that's why they're called spring ephemerals. Ephemeral meaning short-lived. Um, if anyone's familiar with mayflies, if anyone goes down to little creeks or goes fishing, or if you're a fly fisher, uh, fisher person, mayflies are little insects that come out of the creek. Their, uh, their order is ephemeroptera, from ephemeral, short-lived. And so our spring wildflowers will often flower early in the season, uh, leaf out, get maximum amount of sunlight energy, to photosynthesize, store as much as they can in an underground bulb or some kind of storage structure. Uh, and then the leaves die the, um, and the flowers wither uh, often by early uh, to late summer. So they're, they're, they do deserve the name ephemeral because again, it's really hard to see some of these guys unless you're out. I was out the other day, uh, where was I? I was just uh, north of Ajax and the spring beauty, if you're familiar with that uh, uh, group of wildflowers, the spring beauties, little tiny cute guys. I don't think I have a photo of it on the side there they were already flowering and looked like they were almost starting to finish up in a certain area I was in. 
And I, I didn't even know they were flowering. So they're very, very tricky to see sometimes. So you got to go out earlier than you think. Let's move over here. I thought I'd start off with trilliums, which is, I think, um, from my experience teaching kids and teaching adults, one of the most easily or readily recognizable wildflowers in Ontario. It's, you know, it's on your health card. It's all over Ontario websites. And so uh, trilliums, I thought it'd be a good one. Um, most people are familiar with the white colored trilliums, uh, less so with um, the other species. And it's kind of interesting. We've got a, around five native species. And I say around five native species because there's some debate about the rarer ones. Were they intentionally planted? I'm not an expert botanist. I was just going off of records online and talking to, to much more knowledgeable botanists than I. But the ones that you guys are going to see around uh, Durham region, York region, wherever, around the uh, GTA, the Greater Toronto area, uh, you're going to see large white trillium, you're going to see red trillium, and you're going to see nodding trillium. Now, the problem with sometimes with these common names, you know, um, if you guys are familiar with common names, uh, if not, I'll just go into it here. Common name is going to be what we colloquially refer to uh, a species as. So mountain lion, cougar, puma, all the same animal. So trilliums is, is the name for this group of flowers. And then below it, uh, it says trillium species, that little uh, species epithet below the trillium there. That refers to the genus. So that's the scientific name for these organisms. So my point here is, I would call something like the red trillium, the red trillium. Some people call it purple trillium. Some people call it wake robin. There's 42 common names for the same plant. So it can be a little overwhelming. Um, but you know, we can talk about um, uh, scientific names a little bit later. But if you want to figure out what a species is, it's often good to search by scientific name. And there's lots of great websites out there now to do that. Uh, there's um, iNaturalist is a good one. I'm sure we can talk about that later. So anyway, we've got large white trillium, red trillium, and nodding trillium is around this area as well. Um, I was I was looking on some online records. I don't see nodding trillium as often, but we have it here as well. Painted trillium can pop up, but it's generally more northern in distribution. Painted trillium has this, uh, this typical trillium flower shape, but with more of a, a reddy pink uh, center, kind of pointing towards the pollen and the nectar of the trillium flower to guide pollinators down. Whereas the white trillium on the screen, big white flower, yellow pollen, or pollen, really big contrast to allow the bees and the early spring pollinators to find it. Drooping, till, uh, drooping trillium, sorry, is uh, southwestern a bit. I think uh, I'd have to check the, the map on that. I think it goes north a bit too, but that's an endangered species. So less likely to see that one as well, but they're all fantastic. So the, uh, there's the red trillium. Scientific name is uh, trillium erectum. You can see why it gets the red name. Some people call it purple trillium as well. And if you've kind of clued in on trilliums or you don't know anything about them before, you're just hearing about them for the first time, uh, think trillium, think tri, tri meaning three. Uh, these bad boys have one, two, three petals and a lot, and they have three leaves or three bracts or three sepals, depending on the terminology you want to use. It doesn't matter, but their parts come in groups of three. So think trillium, think tri, think three. So the red trillium is common here and they're going to start to come up soon. I haven't seen any. You guys let me know in the chat if you have. Uh, white trilliums are just starting to come up in my area. I'm in Curtis. Uh, they're just almost peeking open. Uh, nodding trillium, um, nodding trillium, because the flower is nodding downwards, facing towards the ground. So uh, you might have to get down a bit and peek up underneath the, the leaves in the spring to see if what you're looking at is uh, a trillium flower that's lost the flower top due to animals grazing, uh, like such as deer, or if you're actually looking at something rare, the nodding trillium, where the flower is facing downwards. You can see that the petals on the nodding trillium are also reflexed backwards, which is kind of a cool attribute where if we go back, um, the uh, white trillium or large white trillium, trillium glandiflorum, the petals do recurve, but not so much. And the flower is up really big and really high. So you'll see large white common, red everywhere as well. Depends on your habitat. Uh, and nodding trillium is a treat to find. Let me know if you find one. I'd love to go photograph one. Uh, we've also got painted trillium, which is, again, is a favorite of mine. I had to steal some photos of people online and borrow them uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm never around their habitat, apparently, when they're flowering. So I haven't got any good photos of not, or painted trillium in a while. But you can see the why we call it painted trillium, those big um, uh, contrasting colors guiding pollinators down to the center to, to contact the pollen and drink the nectar and then spread the pollen to cross fertilize or cross pollinate, sorry, these plants. Really cool. I just threw drooping trillium in there for funsies. It, to me, is very, very similar to nodding trillium. Some people argue about the identification of them. Don't worry about that. Unless you're a really hardcore trillium nerd, you don't need to get into that. But it's uh, one to keep an eye out for. Take some pictures. And if you're ever wondering how to identify uh, flowers or how to take good photos, try to take pictures of the flower morphology, like the structure, the leaves, as much as you can. Nice, clear photos. And you can upload them to websites such as like iNaturalist 
and uh, the experts on there can help you out if you think you found something a little rare. Um, oops, sorry. Another cool thing about Trillium, uh, which I wanted to transition to here. Sorry, guys. My screen's a little weird on me there. There we go. Um, is they have what's called eliasomes, which a lot of um, spring ephemeral wildflowers have. So what an eliasome is, is this cool structure. And again, I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Uh, it's it's the seeds on the bottom. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. It's fine. Uh, but on the bottom, you see the seed structure. And then you see little packages, kind of fleshy material sticking off of those seeds. Those are the eliasomes. And so things such as hepaticas, again, you don't need to memorize these names, but hepatica, some of you might be familiar with, bloodroot, wild ginger, which is popping up in my yard right now, it's flowering, uh, and white trillium, they all have these questionable or somewhat odd looking weird little fleshy sacks on them. And they confused a lot of early naturalists, people didn't know what they were for, for until someone actually watched ants grabbing onto them, seeming inter seemingly interested in them, and carrying them back to the nest. So what eliasomes are is they're uh, rich in proteins and lipids, depending on the plant species. And essentially, they trick ants, if you will. Or you could think of it as a relationship, you know, here's a little bit of fat, here's a little bit of protein if you carry my seed for me. And the ants will grab them and distribute the seed. So it's really cool. I think most people are familiar with wind dispersal. You throw uh, maple seeds or a dandelion, uh, the seeds of the pappus of the, the seed head. You blow on them, they go in the wind, seeds move around because plants can't walk. Uh, how spring wildflowers do it, it's kind of interesting because if you're growing low to the ground, not a lot of wind down at that boundary layer, not a lot of uh, of, of action going on at that, that base layer. Your seeds aren't going to travel as far in a closed woodland. If you're in a sheltered valley, again, not as much wind. You could argue about the ecology of it different ways, but essentially you got to get your seeds from point A to point B. You trick some ants. So we're going to use our, our little liasomes uh, to get the ants to bite them and move them. There's been research done that also shows that um, a lot of people thought that the ants would just eat the eliasome and chuck the seed into a waste pile and that that waste pile was full of nutrients and that would allow the seed to grow. It turns out there's some evidence for that, but also apparently, well, not apparently, ants do have a lot of antifungal, antibacterial compounds that they secrete. And so it turns out that with the ants transporting these seeds, they also kind of confer a little bit of that antifungal resistance, antibi uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, sorry, anti antibacterial, antifungal uh, resistance to these plants so these seeds can grow up in an environment where there's not a lot of competing fungi and bacteria that are trying to overwhelm and kill the seed. Crazy area of study and fascinating. I just love how most of our native wildflowers seem to chuck their seeds out there and ants transport it for them. Now, just saying ants, you know, you might think, you know, your, the black ants you've seen on the pavement or big giant carpenter ant, it's actually a species of ant in the genus of Thenogaster. Again, you don't need to know that, that scientific name unless you're a big ant nerd, in which case, talk to me later. But these are often called the collared ants because tropical species have kind of a neck. And the art species don't really, but these, these, these ladies are fantastic. And I say ladies because it's the females in the colony that do all the work. Um, the males are just for reproduction. Again, ask me questions about that later if you guys have questions. But these guys are the ones that are, uh, think of these guys instead of collar dance, I'd call them forest dance is probably a better name. They love, most of our species love living deep, dark, rich forests. Uh, you know, if you rip up a log, these guys will be slowly cruising around underneath it. And they're cruising the forest floor, uh, looking for these little seeds and distributing them. I think they're fantastic. Um, they, uh, do they have a sting? I think these guys do have a sting. I've never been stung by one. I've tried, but you really would have to poke them a lot to get them to sting you. Um, most of our ant species in Ontario actually don't sting. They spray formic acid or secrete different compounds. Again, that'll be a different talk. I'm just getting excited about ants now. Yeah. So another one coming up right now is sharp-lobed hepatica, which is a really cute one. Uh, they pop, uh, sorry, sharp-lobed and round-lobed. I, I, I wanted to focus on sharp-lobed today. But sharp-lobed hepatica comes up and, and the leaves, these little um, uh, three-parted leaves, they have, they kind of come to a point. Whereas round-lobed hepatica, the leaves are rounded. So pretty easy wildflower to identify. Red trillium, white trillium, love it. Round lobed, sharp lobed, nice and easy for the beginner botanist. So these guys here are one of the first flowers to emerge. I saw some, oh my goodness, might have been, it's over a week now, they were popping up. And it's really, really cool what they do. You'll see the flowers often come up before the leaves. But if you look closely, you'll see that the old leaves from last year are still there. And those old leaves actually help to photosynthesize. So we got these old leaves kind of beaten up. They're often red. They contain protective pigments that the plant makes. Think of it as plant sunblock. Um, just like humans, how we have melanin in our skin. 
uh, to act as a natural uh, protection from the sun. These bad boys will come up and they'll be, uh, they'll already be there from last year and they'll be red in color. And that's gonna protect it from just the harsh sunlight blasting through the, the forest where there's no leaves on the trees. Anyway, the point of that is that these leaves will help to jumpstart photosynthesis to get these guys growing as fast as they can before they lose the light later in summer when the trees leaf out and shade the understory of the forest. These ones are a little tricky though, because we walk into the forest and you'll see them all around you. They're beautiful, but you'll see purple and pink and white, and kind of blue. And you'll think every one is a different species, but it just has to do with the, um, what's called phenotypic, plas uh, not plasticity, but variability, uh, which is fancy words for things look different. You know, uh, my genetics allow me to look like this. Your genetics allow you to look a little bit different. We're all human, but we're genetically variable in how we look. So these flowers have different colors and you could argue, is it to attract different pollinators? Does it, uh, do the white ones get pollinated more than the blue ones or the purple ones? We don't really know, but it'd be an interesting study uh, to, to look in on. I think I should have, there we go, there's the picture. So on this slide, you'll see um, the red leaf. So that red leaf in the top left-hand corner, that's from last year. That's a beat up old last year leaf. And the flowers blooming, I just took this like last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember. The flowers blooming on the bottom right, they're coming up before any new leaves emerge. So again, this is another strategy. Get your flowers out, open them up, get them pollinated by early spring bees uh, and flies and even beetles. And then um, um, once you're pollinated, produce your seeds, grow a new set of leaf, absorb as much sunlight as you can, and then go dormant as the canopy closes over and light levels drop later in summer. Just a really cool species and very common, so I thought I'd focus on it. What else we got? This one I just thought I'd throw in a weird one, guys. Sorry about that. This is Dutchman's Breaches. Um, named after, as you can see, apparently breeches uh, that Dutchmen used to wear. I'm assuming other people wore or used to wear breeches, but you know, we have to look that up. But anyway, so it's that more exaggerated shape to the pants and uh, in reference to the way the flower looks. Now, um, the flowers, if, I, if you look down at the uh, bottom uh, left, the flowers, they kind of go up and they've got those little pointy lobes. In. Those little pointy lobes are what's called like the nectar spurs. And so a bee will come along and stick its tongue into either end uh, to lick the nectar at the end. But when you look at flowers, it's kind of interesting um, because you got to ask yourself, how is that pollinated? Because these flowers are kind of big, you know, a bumblebee can hang off of them. And so, you know, do, do the tiny bees crawl in? Do the big bees, you know, rip it open? It turns out that uh, the little bees, let me, I can go back and forth here. Uh, there's a slide. So on the uh, left is a bumblebee and they're big enough and strong enough to physically open up these flowers and the to their tongues are long enough to actually reach the nectar at the bottom. Whereas the cute little tiny spring bees, you probably never even notice them flying around. Most people don't until you take a closer look. Most people pay attention to the you know big giant wasps that are trying to sting you in the face when you're out having a picnic in the fall. Um, but these big fat bumblebees are strong enough to open the flower and get inside uh, and lick the nectar at the end of the nectar spur. Okay, well in nature, um, not everybody plays by the same rules. So the flower on the right has holes chewed in it. So if I'm a tiny bee, I got a tiny tongue. I, I can't reach the nectar. What am I going to do? They go over and they chew a hole near where the nectar is up at the top of that nectar spur and steal the nectar without pollinating the plant. So in nature, you know, it, we like to think of it as sort of a, a more harmonious, beautiful balance. It is wonderful, but there are sneaky strategies for organisms to bypass the strategy of another. So in this case, this poor Dutchman's breeches on the right didn't get pollinated, got chewed open and had his nectar stolen. But don't worry, I'm sure a bumblebee pollinated another one. Just going back to this slide, in order to identify it, guys, if you're ever out looking for it this spring, please do. I don't find them very common. It's more of a habitat thing. I find them on um, shady slopes, like deep, rich woodlands. And you can see that their leaves are very, very finely divided and they have a flower stalk comes up also known as an inflorescence with these little dangling things that look like a dutchman's pants that he put on a drying rack to dry out in the spring sun so they're really really cool there's a related species called squirrel corn because the storage structure underground it's very shallowly buried and if you go for a walk in the spring after a rain it looks like there's corn all over the ground it's kind of weird that's squirrel corn which is a related species and if these guys look familiar to you they're in the same group as bleeding hearts which is a common uh, backyard horticultural garden plant. I like these guys a little bit better because I like to watch the bumblebees pollinate. It's pretty cool, but still a cool plant. Whoops. Um, violets. 
Again, we could probably spend like seven hours just talking about violets, and I think everybody would be bored to death. But again, they're a really cool wallflower, but they're diverse. They're diverse in color and size, uh, leaf, leaf shape, uh, diverse in habitats, like super dry, sandy, uh, or, you know, growing out of a stump in a bog. So I was trying to focus on plants you guys would see walking around out in the spring. So violets are in the genus Viola. We have over 10 different species native to Ontario. They can hybridize a little bit. They're, there's a couple invasive, meaning no, maybe not invasive, more introduced in certain pockets around Toronto, GTA. You'll see little pockets of ones that are brought over from Europe. They don't really look like the wild violets you see in the forest. Um, they pop up in your lawn. Some of those are just not native species. There's still violets and pollinators will still use them. I wanted to kind of um, talk about the flower. I didn't talk about that yet. So if you're looking at plants, um for the first time one of the cool ways to think about flowers is in terms of their morphology of the flower how they look so when you look at a like dutchman's breeches they're not the typical you know round flower that kids will draw you and give you on you know mother's day or valentine's day a nice round flower like a sunflower if you will these ones are called bilaterally symmetrical bi meaning two and if you cut it in half the right side equals the left side just like a human face so these flowers look a little funky so they're not what we call radially symmetrical. Think radial, think round. Some flowers are round, they're radially symmetrical. Some are bilaterally symmetrical. Left half equals the right. They're not round. So I'm showing you a couple bilateral um, ones, whereas the trillium would have been a little bit more of a radial symmetry. So violets, when you're out in the forest and you see kind of a flower that's like, you know, kind of a weird shape, the top doesn't really equal the bottom and there's like a lip coming out and they're kind of fuzzy, you're probably dealing with a, a small little violet um, and they're often difficult to identify. You have to look at the little hairs inside the flower, if you guys can see that in the picture, to see if they're glandular or if they're straight. You got to look at the length of the back of the flower where the nectar is. I'll show you in another photo. There we go. Uh, this is a little white guy. This is, whoopsies, uh, they changed the name on the tsunami. This should be, oh, I had it up there, but I can't see it now anymore. Oh, I thought, oh yeah, Vi uh, Viola minuscula. I, I don't know what the common name of this guy is anymore. They keep changing it on me. But you can see the back of the flower is a little nub, and that's where the pollen would be. Um, this is a cute little one. You can see it's white in color. The petals are reflex, but it doesn't look like a typical flower structure. It's got that bilateral symmetry to it. It's pretty cool. We won't get into all the different species. I just wanted to show you a couple. Um, the really cool thing, I, I'm, I'm big on ecology. I'm big on how, how animals and organisms do the things they do and why. I really like plants that go ballistic. And what I mean by that is plants that shoot their seeds. We have a couple different species in Ontario some native, some not native, that can actually shoot their seeds. So we talked about ants as grabbing the seed because it, it's tasty to them, it smells good, bring it back to your nest, eat the little fatty bit, chuck the seed in the garbage pile, and a beautiful spring wildflower grows out of it. Violets kind of do a bit of both. Um, and what they and I've actually never seen this because, again, a lot of these uh, explosive motions are hard to capture on camera, and there's some of the like faster movements of organisms on Earth. What how violets do it is they split open. So the photo on the right shows a whole bunch of seeds, kind of in a split open seed pod. Looks a little odd. What violets do is they have a seed capsule in three parts, and it opens up. And I was taught incorrectly. I was taught that that's what would shoot the seeds out, like um, um, orange jewelweed, uh, another native flower. But that's not what happens. They open up, and then the sides of that channel squeeze. I'm trying to do it with my hands on the screen here. The sides of the channel squeeze. And they shoot the seeds out like pressure, kind of like you guys grabbing a pea pod and squeezing it, and the peas shoot out through the other side. So it's really cool. As it dries, it shoots those seeds off. But violets, you know, they got two strategies going for them. They're going to chuck their seeds as far as they can so that they don't grow right beside their mother plant. They don't want any competition. They want to get out of there, right? Just like, um, I don't know if any of you guys have kids. I got three of them. My wife kidnapped them to keep it quiet uh, so that they weren't burning down the house while I was doing this. But uh, sometimes the key, kids, they got to leave the nest, right? If you've got kids going off to college, university, these guys want to leave and grow in a, a new patch on their own. And they've also got an eliasome as well. So they shoot out and they have the little structure that allows ants to move them around. So it's pretty cool. So they can travel even farther. All right, guys, I'm sorry if you guys hate sedges. I got to talk about them. They're awesome. Um, sedges, why am I talking about something that looks like grass that nobody cares about? No offense if you guys like sedges. I love them too. Sedges are dominant in the forest. So if you guys are going out in spring to look at things, if you're walking through a meadow, if you're walking through a forest, if you're walking through a wetland, if you're walking through a rock barren, it doesn't matter. You're stepping on sedges, you're walking by sedges, they're everywhere. 
they're ubiquitous in the landscape. And yet we don't notice them because they just look like grass. And for you know, lack of a better term, a lot of us suffer from plant blindness where I mean, it's green, it's got some leaves and they all look the same. The cool part about biology or science or just anything getting outside is taking the time to look a little bit closer and you can start to perceive the differences. Oh, this one has a little bit wider leaves. This one is a little bit, uh, this one I've only seen growing in a pond or this one's got big chunky spikes on it. What the heck am I looking at? So the reason I'm talking about sedges is because they're so diverse in Ontario. And again, don't worry, guys, I won't I won't do a six hour lecture on sedges. Um, but there's over 200 species native to Ontario. Uh, I am just starting to learn as many as I can. They're fantastic. A lot of them are very rare, but a lot of them are super common and they're in every habitat you uh, travel. I challenge you to go to any any Durham region, York region, GTA conservation area and not see a sedge. You can. not They're everywhere. Um, so they're dominant members of the ecosystems. But, you know, they're overlooked. They're not as showy. They're not as flashy. They're not as cool. Sorry, guys. They're not as cool as the flowers, the big colorful ones. Again, I you got to look closer and give the the um, the unnoticed things a little bit of love. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Click the screen here. It's messed up. My apologies, guys. So sedges are incredibly diverse. I took some of these snapshots here just to throw them on there to show you guys the diversity of sedges. Uh, ag agreeably, the flowering structure is not as as exciting. But what you're looking at on the screen here on the bottom, uh, these are called the paraginia. Basically, it's an inflated sac with a seed in it, and it gives sedges that cool, or at least sedges in the genus Carex, it gives them that cool structure and shape. And it's diagnostic for many species. If you want to get uh, your, if you want to get your plant nerd on, you know, get out a magnifying glass and a tiny ruler, and you got to start measuring all the tiny aspects of these seeds to identify some of the hard ones. But a lot of them are pretty diagnostic. Some of them are big, giant, spiky seeds, like literally, like you know. Almost the size, of, uh, almost the size of like the digit of your finger. Some of them are minuscule, and they're like papery flakes of dust. Um, but yeah, the point is they're in every habitat, and you'll see them everywhere. They're fantastic, and because they're in every habitat, if you're wondering, or in every habitat, if you're wondering why I'm talking about them, a lot of animals eat them. So again, we've got trilliums. Uh, you know, uh, there a lot of animals eat those, and the ants will disperse their seeds, and pollinators love them. All the flowers I talked about visited by pollinators. Sedges are wind pollinated for the most part, but animals will still eat their pollen and their seeds are eaten by everything. Their leaves are eaten by caterpillars. Yeah, but hey, they go unnoticed because again, they're not as pretty. They're not as flashy. I think they're pretty cool. Um, so why am I talking about them now? Well, it's spring. Uh, I want you guys to get outside and poke all the critters you can find. But a lot of our woodland species of sedges, they're following the same ecology as, as woodland wildflowers or the ephemeral flowers. They're trying to maximize growth early on in the season before the sun goes away. So our woodland sedges in Ontario will often flower out. Some of them are already done. It depends on your area you're in. They've already flowered and they're forming seeds very, very early on. Um, a lot of these plants are called cool season plants. Um, spring ephemerals, they'll grow, they'll wither and kind of, they don't die, but they wither and go dormant. Sedges will grow, uh, these ones at least will grow in the cool season in the spring kind of shut down in the summer when light levels go down, they grow a little bit, produce some seeds, and then grow back again next spring. Pretty cool. Um, their seeds are also dispersed by ants. I don't know what it is about woodlands and ants and seed dispersal, but ants just rock, rock it at dispersing seeds in woodland habitats in spring. I don't know what it is. Um, they're also host plants for many species of butterflies and moths. If you love uh, butterflies, which are flashy and showy like flowers, or if you like moths, which are butterflies, less pretty cousins, I, I beg to differ. There's a lot of cool moss, but we can argue about that later. So they're important. But again, I just wanted more people to know about them. Um, if you're wondering what the heck you're looking at, sorry, I realized I didn't show you guys. Uh, on the on the, on the the left, uh, up at the top, all that yellow stuff, that's the pollen. So that would be the male flower. And right below it, you see like a little wispy thing right below that flower. That's the female part. So often the, the male part will bloom above the female or the female will bloom above the male. It depends on the species. But a lot of these plants will have both male and female uh, parts to them and some plants will be entirely male or entirely female it's kind of neat um, and sedges they deserve a closer look all right so now I've, I've talked about sedges and you're asking yourself uh, Matt what what are sedges I, I, I still don't know and I still don't really care that much well there's a cute little uh, rhyme sedges have edges rushes are round grasses are hollow what have you found that's one of them there's different variations so there's a grass on the left there's a sedge on the right of your screen hopefully I'm doing that right um, they look the same to most people. Yeah, to me, even 
that that said, just got flat leaves. That grass has got kind of yeah, the kind of flattish leaves. They both kind of look grassy to me. What if you really want to know if you what you're dealing with is a sedge or a grass? You have to take a little bit of a closer look. So I got an image here for you guys to take a peek at. So sedges are often triangular in cross section. That's the sedges have edges part. But in reality, nature doesn't like to play by our rules of definition. Uh, and as humans would like to put things in the little boxes, they don't always fit. So not all sedges are triangular in cross section. Okay. So what to do then? Basically, if you have a little stem coming up and it's triangular in cross section, you've got a sedge. But if you cut it open and it's a solid inside, like with a pithy material, it's a sedge as well. But if you cut it open and it's hollow, you're dealing with a grass. Don't have to worry about the flower structure, guys. We could probably do a different sedge lesson, lesson or a sedge um, 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 webinar. So sedges have edges generally, generally little triangles for the most part, and they're solid. Rushes are generally round. Uh, they're related to sedges. Grasses, sedges, uh, rushes are all related. Um, but these guys are round and they're solid in the middle. They have a slightly different flower structure, different seeds. Don't worry about that. I just want to show you the difference between sedges, generally triangular, and grasses, round. And they're hollow. So you'll often pick apart a grass and it will be hollow in the middle. The other cool thing about grass is they have nodes. So if you can't really see if it's triangular and cross-section, grab your grass. So I don't have any grass around me. But grab your grass and uh, feel, up, feel up the stem or the, the lower part of the inflorescence. And if you feel bumps, those are nodes. That's where uh, the, the stems will connect and leaves will branch off of a node, but those are grasses. If you're feeling this thing that looks like a grass and it's kind of triangular, kind of round, and it has no weird bumpy nodes, then you're probably dealing with a rush or a sedge. Again, it doesn't really matter. Grasses are awesome too, but I just thought I'd, I'd point out the diversity of sedges we have here because they're really, really dominant plants in forests. When you're going for a walk and you see what looks like a grass in a forest, it's, you know, 70% of the time, it's probably a sedge. And there are a couple of forest grasses that are dominant um, around this area as well. They're kind of cool, though. All right. No talk about plants would be complete without talking a little bit about trees and shrubs. So trees and shrubs are flowering plants. But just like our buddies, the sedges, unless you're like a tulip tree, if you guys are familiar, or a magnolia, maybe you guys have them in your gardens, or a flowering dogwood, or beautiful apples opening up. Um, you forget that trees are flowering plants. So like your maples, no, nobody says, ooh, maple flowers, except for me, I like them. Um, there's a flower uh, that's beaked hazelnut on the, the side of your screen there. The little, the little starburst thing, not the dangly guys, those are the male parts, but the little starburst guy, that's the flower, just a tiny little nub. And that's the female part of the, um, the beaked hazelnut. No one's planting these for their flowers. I think they're pretty cool, but again, they're not as flashy. So what, what, what the heck is a tree or a shrub? They are just basically plants that have woody tissue, that's all. I thought trees, again, growing up, maybe I had a bad teacher, maybe I didn't pay attention in class. Um, I thought trees were just a group. So like cats are a group of organisms, dogs, turtles. We understand that as humans. I thought tree was a group. Everybody grows up, everybody gets big, everybody's kind of woody, he's got that woody material. I'm looking around here for a piece of wood. There's probably some behind me. But it turns out the tree is not really a group. It's more of a strategy. So palm tree is not related to your maple trees, right? They're they're distant cousins. Pine trees, not related to your maple trees. You know, they're all we're all they're all plants, but they're not closely related. And so basically plants, if you know, take my hand, I don't know if you guys can see my face here, but if you take my hand and you take different groups of plants, they've evolved to become trees independently of one another. So they just decided, you know what? I'm gonna get big, I'm gonna get woody, so I can grow up, shade out my competition, and survive. So tree is less of a thing, like a distinct group, and more of a strategy. So there you go. You can go home. If you forget everything I said, go home and you can grab someone and shake them and say trees aren't real. Well, not a real group, but they're a, they're a thing, all right. Um, why trees? Why do we care? Why do we care about trees and shrubs? Oh, sorry, I forgot. Shrubs and trees. Somebody decided if it's small and woody, we'll call it a shrub, like under 16 feet. I don't know where they got the number. And then people said, okay, it's above 16 feet, got one main stem, roughly. If it's big, we'll call that a tree. It doesn't really matter, guys. Woody tissue, um, and they're, they're generally pretty big. It's a shrub, right? We've got little shrubs. Poison ivy is a shrub. It has woody tissue, but it doesn't get very tall. So why do we care? They support, sorry, they support a huge diversity of organisms. Um, so again, I'm talking about things maybe, yeah, I think most people love trees, but they love birds. They love mammals, the cute stuff, baby birds, like beautiful, colorful birds, hawks and owls, just so cool cute little chubby bunnies. Everybody loves this stuff. 
and most people can admire the beauty of a big giant tree but we kind of miss the point on the importance of them yes they're fun to climb and fall out of yes they you know rain down nuts that we can then eat or throw at each other fantastic um they provide shade all that good stuff erosion control they hold the soil all this good stuff that plants do but we forget that there's hundreds upon hundreds of different bugs and little critters that no one cares about that eats them so i'm making a connection to birds here I, I will get to the point guys it's been a long day but insects feed all of these other cute organisms that we love so birds a lot of them are insectivorous or if they eat seeds uh, and, uh, and fruits, they will switch to insects as a high protein diet to feed their young when they come up to Canada to lay eggs and to breed before they move back down south. So these trees are supporting, they're just basically uh, feeders for birds. So they're nesting habitat, but they're also just like a buffet of organisms living in and around the tree that birds can feed on. So if you hate trees, and you think they're boring and you love birds, you know, maybe hug a tree. They're fantastic. Okay. So you're going to go outside. You love trees now. You want to give them a high five, shake your hands, get to know them. Just briefly, guys, again, this is not a tree talk. I can't talk to you about the over 80 something species of trees and shrubs in Ontario. Um, but what are you kind of looking at? One of the easy ways, if you're just getting out there, guys, just starting to think about plants, um, maple, ash and dogwood, or just think MAD. There's a, there's a little acronym, uh, MADCAP horse, MAD for maple, ash and dogwood, and they're opposite. So opposite me, I, I threw the picture on there, but opposite meaning the branches come up and they split and the leaves or the branches are opposite each other. So perfectly on opposite sides of each other. Those are oppositely arranged leaves. And you ask yourself, why do I care? Well, you don't have to be an expert on the over 80 species of trees in Ontario to really quickly narrow it down. If you walk out into a forest and you notice that every single leaf is coming off opposite and it's a tree, like a big tree with bark, it's a maple tree, it's an ash tree, it's a dogwood. Those are the main groups. There's also a group called the Caprifoliaceae. Um, that's fancy science talk for your viburnums and a couple other different species that generally stay smaller. We'll get to that later. You don't, you don't have to worry about that now. But if you're just getting into trees, go out and see who's opposite and who's alternate. So if you see opposite, right out of the gate, you're dealing with a maple, of which we have a handful in Ontario. You're dealing with an ash, unfortunately, which is getting hit by the emerald ash borer beetle. If you guys have had lovely ash trees on your property and you're wondering why your tree died in the last was it, 10 years, I had to check my watch. Um, that's why. The emerald ash borer uh, came in and would have killed your ash trees. But good news, they're still here. I go for a hike. I see lots of different ash trees, but it's the smaller ones regenerating. They are producing seed. We will still have ash trees, but they're not doing as well as they once did. So maples everywhere, ashes everywhere. Dogwood, a little bit shorter. And 99% of the time, they will have opposite leaves as well. So if you're if you're dealing, I'm trying to think where you guys would see dogwoods. I think most people have gone for a hike and you've seen a branch and it's blood red in uh, this time of year and especially in winter. Those are a couple of different species of dogwoods. Um, um, oh my goodness, common names: blue-footed dogwood, uh, uh, red osier dogwood, silky dogwood. Different species will have more or less red to the bark, and they're shorter, shrubby, beautiful, and they're opposite. So that's an easy way to memorize your dogwoods. Everybody else, that's the harder part. Your cherries, your plums, um, your birches, your beeches, your oaks, all those fantastic guys are alternate. So if you want, ignore everybody else for now where you're learning about trees. If you're already a tree expert, you know, go a little deeper. But if not, look for some opposite guys, and that's your main groups of maples, ashes, and dogwoods. So mad, think mad, maple, ash, dogwood, opposite. Okay, so I, I kind of introduced the concept of trees is important for wildlife. If you're unfamiliar with the term keystone species, it refers to an arch. When you have a stone arch, you have the middle stone. That's referred to as the keystone. Because if you remove the keystone, the arch collapses. And so what this is in reference to is the keystone species concept is a species that if you remove it from the landscape, it's going to have crippling effects on the ecology of that system. In simpler terms, if you get rid of these trees, you have less bugs, less birds, less bees, less everything, right? They're a very important species. I just, I took a picture of some twigs and I threw them on the bottom for you guys to show you. They're not in order, but the keystone species of our region in Ontario, it's most of Ontario, but in, in Ontario where we tend to hang around are the maples. So um, let me back it up actually. Sorry guys, I get too excited. The keystone species, these guys are the most bang for your buck, meaning if you want to plant a tree to attract the most uh, critters in terms of, I sorry, bugs, uh, wildlife, 
to live on and in and with your tree, these are the best trees for. So maples, uh, oaks, cherries, willows, and poplars. Cherries is a broad group. It's in the genus Prunus. Prunus. It includes um, all of our cherries, but also plums. We have a, a two native plums, uh, American and Canadian uh, plum, last time I checked, uh, that are native. And those are just like, food for everybody. A whole bunch of bugs and caterpillars eat them, which in turn feeds all the birds. If you've ever tried to grow like a cherry tree and all the leaves are getting chewed or your maple tree is getting chewed by caterpillars or your willow is getting half gnawed on by caterpillars, there's a reason. They've evolved with these beautiful trees and they are a snack food for all of these insects, which then feeds all of your birds, which everybody loves. But again, I, I threw the twigs on the bottom just to show you that even in this early spring, it's getting nicer now, uh, the weather's been beautiful, but in early spring when everything's still depressing and gray and wet and the frogs haven't come out to party yet, you can still look at these cool twigs and you can actually identify a lot of these by just how the twig looks. Again, maybe we'll have to do a walk. I'll come along and throw twigs at people. It'll be a lot of fun, but they're fantastic. All right, so give, give enough about that. I'll talk about um, this concept of keystone. So um, Doug Tallamy, or uh, Douglas Tallamy, uh, who writes several different books on the importance of um, gardening in your backyard with native plants and the importance of all of our native plants, they've uh, amalgamated a lot of information on which insects use which trees and why we should care, right? Because bird, again, it's all food for birds. When you connect it to birds, all of a sudden the huge bird community starts caring about all of these amazing plants. So at the top of the list, guys, if you see trees, Quercus, that's the genus for oak. It supports 436 different species of butterflies and moth. That's insane. That is, a, I didn't know the number was that high until I looked into this a while ago. It's phenomenal. You go down the list and it's just, you know, one after the other, amazing trees. Prunus, uh, sorry, your plums, your cherries, your birches, your cottonwoods, your maples, which is are in the genus Acer, your crab apples, the native ones, still even eat the non-native ones. Your hickories are fantastic. Pine trees, I, I know they're at the bottom of the list, guys, but pine trees are still amazing. Uh, oh, that might have got cut off. I don't know what you can see on your screen, but at the very bottom is the genus Salix, which are the willows. Incredibly diverse group. They all hybridize. Crazy hard to identify, but everybody loves to eat them. When I go out in the spring and the willows pop their leaves out, I'm always looking for caterpillars. They're all over the willows. So if you're a gardener or you just want to look for caterpillars and butterflies, these are some of the trees to plant and some of the species to look for on your wall. So if you go for a hike, though, I told you we have, you know, over 80 trees in Ontario, lots more shrubs. How are we going to figure out what we're looking for? Well, I picked up, I uh, picked on the oak and I picked on maple to kind of give you a, a little more of a reference if you've never really noticed these trees in their habitat. So for sugar maple, we've got, whoopsies, moving my screen around here guys so I can see what I've written. So for sugar maple, an easy way to know is they've got these nice brown twigs, which is the photo there, and the seeds are kind of plump and they're U-shaped. Whereas the, our non-native maples will often spread their leaves at a wider angle, that's the Norway maple, uh, which is planted all over suburbia, if you guys walk outside of your houses now and start walking around, if you live in a town, there's going to be a Norway maple. How do I know? There's two of them outside my house, all over suburbia. It's a very common tree. But Norway maples are not native to Canada. And so they don't, they're not really chewed on by a lot of caterpillars, which is really sad. They're a beautiful tree. Um, they're, they're, they're still great. They still provide a little bit of early spring pollen. But they're kind of boring for wildlife. They can't utilize it. It's like a beautiful looking um, fruit display and it's all plastic. You can't eat it, uh, which is sad. But if you want uh, to plant a maple or to appreciate a maple, sugar maple. This is the quintessential maple, uh, you know, on our Canadian flag. Uh, and it's where we'd get maple syrup. It's got that tasty uh, tree juice. So the samaras or the seeds are U-shaped is a good key. And if you want to be a real tree expert, uh, how to identify it? One of the really cool ways I'll teach you now is, oh, I should have gone outside and ripped off a branch. If you rip off a leaf of uh, the maple, look at where the, I'm going to do it with my hand here, look at the stem of the maple leaf and the bottom where you ripped it off. If there's white sap coming out, like a white latexy sap, like kind of like milky, it's a Norway maple. If you rip a leaf off of a sugar maple and look at the bottom where you ripped it off, it's called a petiole, uh, where it attaches to the tree. If you look at that little scar you ripped off, it's going to bleed a clear sap. That's one way. That's a cool way. It's, that's a little more destructive. If you don't want to rip off leaves, Sugar maple, go right to the tip of the leaf and it's rounded. I know it comes to a point, but if you look at the tip, it's rounded. Uh, Norway maple will come to a fine hair point, like a really sharp point. I like to use the sap one with kids because kids like to rip leaves off and look at them. 
Um, so the late Texi sap uh, is Norway maple, which is not native, still a cool tree. But yeah, sugar maple everywhere around you guys. It's not rare. Uh, it's one to look for in spring. And when you look at the buds, you can see that the buds are opposite. So this is a maple um, and sugar maple has a nice pointy bud. So think of pointy bud opposite. Leaf looks like the Canadian flag. You got yourself a maple. Pretty cool. Okay, but there's different maples in Ontario, which we'll get to in a sec. I'm not going to go over them all, guys. And also just yell at me if I'm running out of time. What do we got? Okay, got more time. Um, I just wanted to show you. I took a couple pictures of some caterpillars and moths. Just a few. That's just a few. Uh, maples support a huge amount. But you've got the twig mimic on the left, which is a type of... Here's the problem with common names. They call, all, they call half of these guys spanworms. They're not... They're not all related, but they got the maple spanworm. It's that little thing that looks like a twig on the left. You've got the two beautiful looking moths, large maple spanworm, lesser, ma lesser maple spanworm. They're just cool looking moths that love to chew on maple. Some of you might be looking at the caterpillar on the right and wanting to squish it. I, I understand. Um, that's a forest tent caterpillar. We have two species in Ontario. Uh, we have forest tent caterpillars and we have the eastern tent caterpillar. The way to tell them apart is when you look at the back of this caterpillar and you look at the white dots, if you can see the white dots running down the line, the back of the caterpillar, they look like footprints. Think of footprints through the forest, like the front of the, the foot and the heel. So think of footprints through the forest, whereas an eastern tent caterpillar will have a straight line down the back. And those are the ones that tend to blow up in population every couple of years and eat all the leaves. Not gypsy moth, not to be, well, that's, that's not a politically correct term. It's been renamed the spongy moth. The spongy moth will uh, make uh, some webs as well and, and uh, rip all the leaves off trees or eat them all. But the forest tent caterpillars are a native caterpillar. They're part of the natural cycle. And a lot of birds will actually eat them. Uh, apparently cuckoos, you know, bird experts, you can you try to fact check me on this one. But I was always told that cuckoos will actually eat fuzzier caterpillars. They're adapted to eat these fuzzy caterpillars. Fantastic. So food for everybody. Oh, sorry, guys. Click the screen. Okay, so those, you looked at those moths. You said, Matt, those are ugly. I got your pretty moth. This is a rosy maple moth, the caterpillar on the left and the uh, moth on the right. Who says moths aren't beautiful? So these guys are fantastic, very colorful, very cute looking, very fluffy. People make like little stuffed animals out of these and sell them. Um, yeah, they're fantastic. But they don't get a lot of love because a lot of these guys will fly during the night, whereas butterflies will be smacking you in the face during the day. And so we pay them more attention. But still a fantastic species and part of that food web. Um, yeah, really cool. I, I don't want to take too much time just talking about moths all night. Okay, more maples real quick. Uh, in Ontario, we've got a couple different species. Uh, let's go by just our region here. Um, you're more likely to see sugar maple, which we talked about, uh, which is going to be the, where did our sugar maple go? Should be up at the top. Oh, this is good. That picture's okay. Uh, oh yeah, sugar maple, yeah. Ooh, they didn't draw the Samara as well, but that's okay. Amber maple is not native. So the top, uh, the top one in the top left is not native. You've got mountain maple, you've got silver maple, you've got Norway, which is not native, black maples, striped maples. The point is we all, we have a dump, bunch of different species in Ontario. What's the takeaway? They've all got that, what's called like a palmate leaf. Think palmate, think your hand. Uh, and so they've all got a palmate leaf or kind of think of Canadian flag shape or lobes coming out, um, kind of hand shaped, not completely circular leaf coming out splayed like a hand. And so we have different species of maple. Again, we could spend all night talking about all the cool different types of maples, but I just want you guys to get out. And if you haven't gone for a hike or you're unfamiliar with maples or you've never wandered through these ecosystems, look for kind of a palm-shaped leaf and you're probably dealing with a maple. Look for the opposite palm-shaped leaf, trees, you're, you're dealing with a maple. Fantastic. And again, these are keystone species. Everything is chewing on them. Everything loves to eat them from the caterpillars and the tiny beetles that eat their leaves all the way up to moose and deer that browse on them as well, which are fantastic. Not as many moose down here in Durham region. Uh, what else we got? Oaks. Okay, I, I had to talk about oaks because they're fantastic. Um, last fall was a mast year for oaks. Mast year refers to uh, when a tree produces an abnormally large amount of fruit or or seeds or nuts, whatever. It's it's These are the seeds that they're producing. And they do this in order to overwhelm predators so some of your seeds survive. If every year I'm producing the same amount of seeds, I'm just feeding my predators. They're going to eat all of my seeds. I'm never going to grow. But if I produce a couple of seeds on year one, a couple of seeds on year two, you know, no seeds on year three, a couple of seeds on year four, and then five years, every five years, six years, seven years, depends on the plant. Every five years or so, uh, I produce an 
unwieldy amount of, of nuts, like just a, an incredible amount of nuts. Your squirrels, your chipmunks, your turkeys, whatever, your deer, it's too much. They can't eat them all. And so some of your babies survive because every one of these acorns is a little tree baby that's going to grow into a new oak. So oaks in Ontario, they're fantastic. I think they are well known because of their cute little seeds with the cap and the seed at the bottom. They're technically a nut uh, with that, that little cap. And you can see from the diversity, uh, if we go from the top, there's chinquapin oak, swamp white oak, uh, top right. And then below the cute little, little, little round guy, that's pin oak. The weird hairy guys on the bottom left, that's bur oak, fantastic. And then the one uh, middle left is black oak, which is really cool down in Niagara region. We have some up here, they're hard to find. You know, I, can, I can talk to you about those later if you guys want, but we have over 10 species. The sad part about oaks in terms of identifying, I like to identify things so I can know what I'm dealing with, so I can understand it. They hybridize, meaning I'll have a white oak and I'll have a swamp white oak and they'll trade pollen and create like a half white, half swamp white oak hybrid. Burr oak, uh, the fuzzy guy, and then the top right fuzzy guy, kind of less fuzzy. They're like cousins. They can kind of breed together and make little hybrids. It gets confusing. I love oaks, but their identification can be a little tricky. That said, uh, in our region, red oak, white oak, generally that's what you're dealing with. If it's a little higher, a little drier, or you're on a city street, they might have planted bur oak, which is the fuzzy guy in the bottom left, uh, which are also just fantastic. Um, so how do you tell an oak? If maple have palm-shaped leaves like the Canadian flag, oak has more of a long leaf, but give it a little wave, give it a little wiggle, right? And that's how we're going to identify them. I'll show you on the slide next. But again, why do we care about oaks? Everybody eats the leaf. Uh, oaks are number one for wildlife value. If you're talking um, insects in general, like butterflies, moths, the caterpillars, oh, fantastic. And then oaks are like, hey, you know what? I'm amazing. But here, I'm also going to feed everything else my nuts. You know, you've got turkeys and deer and uh, rodents. I know some people don't like rodents, but all of our native mice, uh, birds will eat them. Uh, acorns, they're fantastic. They're feeding everything. So I want to show you real quick before I get into what else is eating your oaks, which would kind of freak you out. I want to get you guys op uh, cracking open an acorn if you find it on the ground to see the weird stuff inside. A general rule of thumb, if you want to keep it really simple for the oaks and you're not traveling in like southern United States, in Ontario, if you see a little wavy leaf with those nice little round margins on the top, you're dealing with white oaks. So white oaks have rounded tips. Red oaks have spiky tips, really, really stabby. So think, you know, when you stab someone, they bleed. That's blood. It's red. Please don't stab people. But that's what I tell my students um, to not stab people. But blood is red. So think the red oak group. They're all related. They all have these spiky lobes. Whereas the top guys are going to have those more nice, sinuous, rounded lobes. Those are white oak group. Cool. So red oaks, think of red oak sharp, white oaks round. Yeah, kind of works. All right. So the cool thing about oaks, everything eats the leaves, everything eats the seeds. But did you guys know that things live in the seeds? So when oaks will drop an acorn, sometimes they're like half rotten. The tree will abort them, meaning uh, it's not going to put any energy into a seed that's kind of half formed or a bug chewed on half of it. So they'll drop. So the majority of the acorns you see on the ground with a cute little cap on it, those aren't viable. Those are dead acorns, if you will, or, or rotten acorns that the tree has dropped. If you open them up, we have a couple different species of ants in Ontario. And I told you I was going to come back to ants. They actually live inside of the acorns. Their entire colony, their entire society fits in an acorn right? So they're fantastic. So again, I challenge you to go out, look for acorns, and if they're kind of half rotten on the ground, uh, pop them open, and you'll probably see a little colony of ants. You know, take a little peek and then put it back on the ground. Uh, it's really, really cool. So they're actually called acorn ants. Um, they're incredibly tiny. I had to get like almost a microscope to take the picture that you're seeing here, the acorn ant. And you can see they've got kind of a formidable looking stinger. They're too small. They cannot sting you. Um, I've poked a lot of these guys. Our, our skin is too thick for them to hurt you. But yeah, they live in it their entire life inside of an acorn. How awesome is that? All right. You're like, Matt, I hate ants. Talk to me about the beetles. Everybody loves beetles, uh, the, the, the musicians and the bug. There's also acorn weevils, which are fantastic as well. Look at that schnoz. So it's not the nose. That's actually the mouth. The mouth comes out of the head and they want to lay their eggs inside of an acorn. But acorns are protected. It's a nut. There's an outer casing. They want the, they want the soft, tasty deliciousness inside the nut. So they actually take their mouth put it on the acorn and they rotate their head like a drill. So I guess you could say beetles evolved drills before humans did because these guys were around for millions of years before us. And so they drill into the acorn, turn around, do a little, do a little booty wiggle and they lay an egg into the acorn through the hole they drilled. And the larva has got to kind of pop out of that same hole later, choose a little bit of a bigger hole. And the cute thing is the acorn ants, 
will often live in acorns that these guys left. So the weevils will pop out. There's a cute little door. The ants say, thanks, man. And they move back in and they live inside the acorn. It's really cool. We have a couple different species in the Northeast. You don't need to be an expert. If you see a weevil, if you guys are unsure what a weevil is, a weevil is a beetle. Those guys with the hard shell, the exoskeleton, uh, wing covers. And it's got a big old schnoz, a big old nose. So if you see a beetle walking on your skin or walking across your porch, you know, don't smush it, take an eyeball, stare at his nose. Maybe he's got a long schnoz, you're dealing with a weevil, which are really, really cool. If he's got a hugely enormous nose, don't make fun of him. He's an acorn weevil. Give him an acorn, let him move in. It's a fantastic beetle. Um, all right. I'm checking our time, guys. I am very, very slow. Um, if you guys want to give me the, the heads up when you want me to stop, otherwise I'm just going to keep talking. Cool? Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So uh, this time of year, so you said, Matt, I love flowers, but I'm tired of looking at flowers. Matt, I love trees, but they're, you know, they're cool, but they're boring. Let's get into the amphibians. So this time of year is a little cold for the reptiles. We've still got snakes coming out of hibernation uh, and breeding. We've got turtles crawling up on the logs to sun themselves. And some of them are doing a little bit of spring breeding um, or courtship displays, but they're a little harder to see. Most of us, I think, notice the screaming that happens in wetlands from all the amphibians that wake up and just go crazy to breed as fast as they can. Uh, so that their tadpoles can develop and survive. One of my favorite is the spring peeper. They're a tiny little frog. Think about the first knuckle. If you've never seen these guys, they're little brown frogs, and they're about the size of the first joint of your thumb. Depends how fat your thumb is. I got a fat thumb. They're a little smaller than that, and they're very, very common. They're tiny, and they're brown, and they're in the forest. So these guys are popping around wetlands and shrubby areas, and they blend in incredibly. They're very hard to see outside of the breeding season. They call them spring peepers because they come out in spring and they peep. Let's see if I can get that thing going, see if this works. Yeah, and so they do that call. Um, and if they, if you're ever wanting to see them, I like to go out in the wetlands in the middle of the night because I'm a weird guy and you can do the. If you can make that noise, they'll call back and then you can find them and hang out with them and be friends with them. But in this case, the spring peeper, uh, they come out in spring and they peep. And that noise you hear, if you've ever been to like a cottage or you're, you're lucky enough to have your house near a wetland, I have one just up the road. I can hear them while I'm sleeping. It's fantastic. Um, they do like a... And what they're doing is they're actually synchronizing. One will call, then another, then another, then another. Because if you're all screaming at the same time, like my high school kids, I have no idea what's going on. But if you alternate, you know, hey, 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 hey then the females can hear you and they can go looking for you. If you didn't know, only the male frogs call and it's their way of saying, hello, I'm here, I would love a date. And then the females come up and they choose the males based on different criteria, depending on the species, often the loudest male. Um, their scientific name is Pseudochris crucifer. Don't worry about the Pseudochris part, uh, but the crucifer, think cross, they often have an X on their back. The one in the image on the right, it was a weird one. He kind of had a squiggly X, but you can kind of see an X shaped mark in the darker markings down his back. So if you see a cute little frog with a little X on his back, you're probably dealing with a spring peeper. Now, they're part of the uh, family of the Hylidae, the tree frogs. And so they actually have sticky toe pads. And so you can see the sticky little toe pads. If you look closely at his toes, he's got those little discs, kind of look like gecko toes. And they're sticky. And they help the frog to adhere to little plants to help them climb. Fantastic. The tree frog test, guys, if you don't know, get your frog, throw it at a wall. If it sticks, it's a tree frog. If it hits the wall and falls down, it's not. I'm just kidding. Don't throw frogs. But look for the little toe pads. So the little toe pads allow them to climb. Whereas our water frogs or our pond frogs, they're going to have no toe pads, like little fingers like your hand, and they're going to have webbing between their fingers, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, again, I could talk about this forever. Oh, real quick, they breed in shallow wetlands, um, and they have to develop before they dry up in summer. So you got to breed early. That's why these guys come out early in spring. Get your eggs out. Get your tadpoles going. The pond starts to, the, the level drops lower and lower and lower in summer. And your little baby's got to hop out before the pond dries up and you can't make it. Really fantastic. Very common amphibian you'll see. Uh, mine were just screaming the other night. They're probably going to be screaming tonight as well. Yeah, they're very common. Very cool frog. Oh, now I'm playing the song again. If you've never seen one call, I had to go out in the middle of the night to get this photo. Uh, and I had, to, I had to talk to him. I had to peep at him. Um, they'll inflate their, their sack down here. Uh, a vocal sac, if you will, the, the chin, whatever you want to call it, there's different names for it. They'll inflate it and kind of move it in and out to vibrate vocal cords. You guys can hear me right now because there's little cords in my throat and I'm pushing air past them to make it vibrate. These guys are pushing air past uh, and blowing it in and out to vibrate their vocal cords to kind of scream uh, to attract the females. 
So this tiny frog, if you're in a chorus of like a couple hundred, it's almost deafening. It actually hurts your ears. I don't know the decibel level. Ooh, I should probably try that one day. I'll probably go out tonight and take a deci decibel meter and see how loud the frogs are. But it's actually painful. Your ears hurt after a while for such a small frog. It's pretty fantastic. Okay, if you're a little more, if you like spring a little more and you're out a little more early, you might even hear the wood frog. These guys can often uh, come out before the ice is fully gone. And there is, they're just a brown wood frog. I think they're fantastically colored, camouflage, but they're so hard to find outside of the breeding season because they just look like a leaf. And um, the best way to find them is to go out when the peepers are kind of calling. You hear the, the peepers. And if you're just listening at night and you think you hear ducks and you're losing your mind, you're not losing your mind. You're actually listening to the wood frogs. They sound like ducks a little bit. I'll play it. Okay, I think they sound a little bit like ducks. But if you're out in the middle of the night and you hear a whole bunch of ducks calling from a puddle in the forest, you're probably dealing with a whole group of wood frogs. Again, we're looking at the same strategy. Um, spring peepers are dumping their eggs in ponds or, or wetlands that often dry up. Wood frogs take it a step further and often do it in forest pools with no fish, no predators, no fish predators. And they have to get their babies out of the water. They got to develop fast enough before the pond will go bone dry in the height of summer. So the, the, pond, the, the water level will drop and it triggers the tadpoles to grow faster and faster and faster and then get out before they die. So you have to develop really, really fast. Um, if you guys don't, uh, I don't know how deep we want to go into frog reproduction. Maybe that will be a different topic for another night. But if you just want a primer, if you're wondering why the frogs in the bottom are hugging, that's called amplexus. It's where the male will grab onto the female and they're like fish. The male releases sperm, the female releases eggs, bada boom, bada bing fertilized eggs and the eggs just kind of float there. I'll show you a picture in a second in the pond and the little tadpoles hatch it. But it's kind of cute. It looks like they're hugging. Yeah, they are hugging. Um, I love wood frogs because they're the most northerly distributed frog in North America. They go all the way up. I think they peak into Alaska. You'll have to check my math, math on that, but they go incredibly far north and they can freeze solid. Again, that, that'd be a whole other two hour talk, but uh, let's do the, the short, short note. They have cryoprotectants. They have molecules that stop certain parts from freezing or to lower the freezing uh, point. And basically their heart stops, the brain stops, there's no cellular activity, they're dead. They're essentially dead. So if you were to find a wood frog in winter, it would be like a little frogsicle. You know, you could put it in your drink, don't put it in your drink. But if you put it on your counter, it would thaw slowly and then would hop away. So they actually come back to life for lack of a better um, way of explaining it. I love them, they're fantastic, really cool frogs, really hard to find in the summer because they're super camouflage. Oh, we just keep playing the sound. This was just showing you a tadpole, showing you the back legs. Frogs will develop their back legs first, and then the front legs pop out, and then they absorb the tail. So if you've ever wondered why frogs don't have tails, they do as tadpoles, but they absorb all of the proteins, fats, you know, muscle tissue, whatever you want to call it, uh, to help the developing frog. So think of that tail as kind of a, it's used for swimming, but also it's like a little meaty snack to help the froglet develop and hop out of the pond. There's wood frog egg mass. I didn't have an underwater photo, uh, so I found this one. They're really cool. They're like, it's a little gelatinous. Mm, I don't know if you guys drink bubble tea. They're, like I know bubble tea, the, the tapioca balls and bubble tea, if you guys have ever had that, uh, or boba, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, it's kind of squishy. They're like that, but smaller. And so they'll, they'll, they'll swell with water, and they stay as a mass uh, in the water. It's really cool. Wood frogs will lay them all together in a big huddle. And the thought is that the sun hits that big huddle of black eggs and warms them up fast. That's the theory. And indeed, in some cases, they hatch fast. American toad, uh, one last one last amphibian. Um, these guys are really cool. Think, take a frog, let them be a little more drought tolerant, and these guys go hiking on land. We have two species of toad in Ontario. The American toad is the one you're going to see in our area. And if you look right behind the eye, there's these little like, um, like uh, kind of kind of looks like a big wart. You don't get warts by uh, from toads, by the way, guys. But it's like a big wart. It contains poison. It's a it's a toxin gland. So if you were to grab the toad and just like kind of lick it or bite it and annoy it, please don't do that. It will secrete a toxin. Uh, it would taste very bitter. Um, and some toads, depending on the species, can kill you know small mammals, dogs, would probably kill a human if you had enough of that toxin. So just don't lick toads as a general rule, guys. Um, they have a call I like to call like a lazy cricket. So like, if you can make like a cricket noise, uh, think of it, slow it down a bit. Kind of like a trip. Oh, that was loud. There's a lot more in there. So it's kind of like a like a like a slower, longer cricket that will never stop. 
they have what's called an explosive breeding strategy where they just go, they wait, they wait. And just like today, it was beautiful. They wait for a little bit of rain, beautiful sun, nice and warm. And they go, okay, so we're good. And you'll have 200 toads hit a pond. The two days breeding is done and they're done, like they're gone. So that's an explosive breeding strategy. They breed all at once. They don't actually explode. That would be cooler, but sorry guys, they don't do that. Oh, sorry. Should I, should I stop? Am I running out of time? Yeah, I think, I think we're uh, just going to get a few questions from, uh, yeah. from the audience, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, but, I will, but... Yes, I will never shut up. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, some incredible stuff to talk about and your, yeah, your enthusiasm is amazing. And I've learned so much tonight and yeah, it's just one of, one of the best webinars that we've, we've done so far, I think. Oh, that's very kind of you. All right. I'm to pop up the chat. Uh, where's Does the anyone chat? have any questions for Matt? Please, please, please. I don't know where the chat is. Oh, there it is. Can't see it. Uh, I, know I was out yesterday and I was seeing blood roots starting to come out. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, the trilliums just they haven't quite opened yet, but the little, everything's sort of peaking up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, someone says Oxalis in California shoot their seeds. Yeah. So uh, we also have um, uh, orange jewelweed. It has many different common names. The pods will swell and you you, you, you touch them and it, they blow up due to water pressure. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. You did such a great job explaining everything that uh, there's no question. Yeah. I talk a little fast. I got I to gotta get all the information in. Yeah. Sorry, but, guys, if I haven't answered any. Sorry about that. Oh yeah, it, it was it was wonderful, and and thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, I'm sure people are gonna really appreciate um, being able to watch the recording of this on YouTube. I'll try to send that out uh, to everyone who registered in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It was it was a great time, and makes me excited to go out this weekend and and look for more amphibians and wildflowers and things like that. And yeah, just uh, yeah, yeah there's, oh, there's so much good stuff. I, I we could do this for hours um but yeah i just want to get some people oh thank you guys i'm just looking at the chat that's very kind of you um i would love to um i'm going to try i was writing down some of your walks that you attended um i'd love to come out on some of them and uh just participate with you guys at some point so that would be fun absolutely yeah i can i can send you an email with all that stuff and uh amazing thank you everyone who joined us as well tonight um yeah i hope everybody has a nice evening and uh we'll see you all soon at the next webinar fantastic bye guys bye